What's up and welcome to the channel. My name is Hegshot and thank you for joining us. Today I'm going to show you my World War II collection so far and guns like this KP9 that we recently reviewed are really awesome. Uh, but there's, you know, there's, well, there's a little bit of history to this one considering the gun it's based off of and all that kind of stuff. But there's something a little bit more special about World War II era, uh, just that general era. So I've always liked history. But World War II, I have really, over the past now two years, have really just dove headfirst into this topic, and I really can't get enough of it. I absolutely love it. And uh, today I'm going to show you some of the things that I've collected so far. They're not all guns. They, they're mostly guns, uh, but they're not all guns. And, and, and I want to show you some of this stuff because I know there's, there's a lot of you out there that really appreciate this stuff, and uh, I can't wait to show you what I've got here so far. So what I will say is there's going to be two versions. There's going to be a Patreon version and then a free version here on YouTube. The bulk of the majority of the stuff will be here on YouTube. So don't think that you're missing out um, just because we're going to have a Patreon version. The stuff on Patreon is going to be stuff that may be a little bit more sensitive. Even though it's in a historical context, I don't think YouTube will allow it to be up on the platform. So it's not it's not... It's not bad stuff, but again, you probably get where I'm going with this. It's stuff that I'm sure can't be monetized and uh, won't be allowed to be up here on uh, YouTube. So there will be two versions if you want to come over or if you're already a patron, uh, come over and check that version out. But again, the bulk of the stuff is here on YouTube, so don't think you're missing out on a ton of stuff. So I just want to make that little disclaimer. So let's get the modern gun out of the way and let's check out some of the World War II guns. All right, so this is how all of this started. Um, I had a friend that I used to work with and he was really into World War II firearms. And I started to dive into the subject because I hadn't done a whole lot of, re you know, I knew basic things, um, but I didn't know a whole lot about it. And I'm like, man, that'd be really cool to kind of implement, you know, kind of include some of that stuff onto our channel. And this is how it started with the Mosin Nagant, how a lot of people start. And um, I was able to pick this up pretty dang cheap, I think. This one is actually a 1943 out of the, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because I'm going to butcher the name, but um, this one is nothing special. It's a run of the mill. It's not a finish. Uh, it's nothing like that. It's it's a 9130 and, and that's what it is. I, I want to say the factory is like the Ishvex or uh, anyways. Again, I knew I was going to butcher that, so I shouldn't even try it. But this is a, a great shooting gun. It has a 762 by 54 r cartridge that it shoots. It's interesting because this gun, obviously, at some point, the receiver and the barrel and everything was painted. And I actually redid the stock myself. I figured, man, what a great opportunity. The guns aren't that expensive. Um, so I'll try to refinish the stock. And I did. And I think it turned out to be pretty dang decent. I'll flip it around here. So you can see it, this thing is only probably 10 foot long. Um, so it takes a little bit of maneuvering, but no, it's not that bad, man. This thing is a great shooting gun. And uh, I absolutely, this is what started it all right here. It's interesting because while you're shooting it with the rim case, uh, sometimes trying to load it in the magazine can be a, a little tricky. Of course, you know, stripper clips make that easier. Uh, but this bolt I've noticed, man, whenever you start shooting and this thing gets heated up, this bolt gets super sticky. It is nothing like a Mauser at all when you start shooting. Uh, but for what it is and for how old it is, again, this one being a 43, I think it's really cool. And this is what started it all. And I did get one of these little ammo pouches that you can wear on your belt. This one actually has an oil bottle and some takedown tools in there. But this gun is just awesome. I mean, there's, it, to me, it's so cool to have something this old that still shoots this good. Now, you may be thinking, man, I've never seen a review on this gun. And you would be right. We actually took this thing out multiple times. And at that period, the hard drive that I was using, it broke. I dropped it and I wasn't able to capture, recapture that footage. And enough time has just passed where I just need to get this thing back out of the range, get some more footage with it. Some would say I was a little salty over dropping that hard driving, losing all that footage. But there are some Patreon videos that I put up with it when I first got it. So there's that. So there's the Mosin Nagant. Let's move on to something else. So from there, I went from the uh, Soviet Union to the American side, of course. 
And this, from what I can gather from the data that's out there, is like a late 50s um, M1 Grand. So no, it does not constitute as a true World War II version, unfortunately. But I needed something that I could shoot, um, obviously for a review, and this happened to be it. But let's be honest, this gun kind of helped win World War II, so it still counts, no doubt about it. It's a, it, it's a really interesting firearm, and of course what makes it super interesting too is the way that you actually load this. Now you'll notice you can pull this bolt all the way back. It looks like it's good to go, but that is not all the way back. That is indeed all the way back, and you will find out super quickly um, if you have not moved that bolt all the way to the rear, I can promise you that. It works off this gas system here, so I'm not going to take the stock off and everything, but you have this op rod right here with a gas tube under here. And um, that's the way it operates. But what's really interesting is the way you load this. You actually have your in block clips. Okay, so here's your in block clips. And this was really revolutionary at the time. You got to think the Germans had the car 98K. Um, at least that's what they entered the war with. They, well, they carried that all throughout the war. The Wehrmacht did. Uh, you had the Russians with the Mosin Nagant. So you have bolt action rifles. Um, and then you have the Americans with an eight round in block clip semi-automatic operation. So this thing was absolutely revolutionary. Now, of course, during the course of the war, things started to change. You had the Sturmgewehr, which the Germans just kind of got to a little bit, you know, a little too late on that one. Uh, of course, you had the submachine guns, the Americans had the grease gun, and then um, you had the, uh, the Soviets with the PPSHs, and, you know, there was all kinds of guns that were coming out, the Sten, of course, from the British. Uh, but entering the war with something like this, compared to most of the troops having bolt-action rifles and this, and five rounds of that, uh, besides the British, I think they had the 10-round Lee Enfield, but um, this was revolutionary, needless to say. So basically, once you push this thing down, it's got rounds in it, it'll go home, and then, of course, on the last shot, this thing will ping and, and fly out of the gun. I noticed that some of the end blocks will ping and some not such a pronounced ping right there, uh, but you can actually release the uh, clip if you want to top it off for whatever reason. This button right here will actually... Uh, release it so you can actually get that in block clip out of there. Uh, this one looks like it was reparkerized at some point. And also, see that bolt goes home right there. It's a rotating bolt as well. Pretty cool design. Um, and also the CMP had it at some point and they put a new walnut stock on there. So again, I wanted something that I could shoot for the review. And then it had this repro sling on there. I actually added this cheek rest which is what the sniper versions of the M1 Grand, uh, they would be using something like that. But again, that's that's reproduction there. But this is an amazing gun. I mean, this thing, uh, you know, at the time we only had 100 yards. I should really take some of these guns out now to our new range and just see what kind of accuracy we could get out there because I'm sure it's absolutely amazing. You have windage and elevation adjustments. And like I said, for the time period, this thing was revolutionary. Shoots the 30 out 6 of course, and there was a bunch of these made during the war. Sticking with the Americans, we're looking at the, the most produced gun of World War II, it, definitely on the American side. Uh, over 6 million of these were made, and this happens to be in Inland, who actually made more of these than anybody. We actually have an Inland 1943 mark up here, and then of course there's proof marks on the barrel. What's interesting about this gun when I got it, was it actually had this stock on here, uh, this one right here, which if you notice, it doesn't have any rivets. So what they did when they first came out with these is they actually used two rivets and then they strengthened it with the four rivets. Well, this one didn't have any rivets, okay? So before I bought it, I didn't know that. It, all the markings on the barrel and the receiver and everything looked really good. So I bought it and I couldn't, I can't find a single thing on this particular stock. This is the lower, part of the stock that it comes with. It has a, a, a 10, which looks like a rack number. Uh, none of the traditional markings are on this gun, and or at least on the, uh, the stock. So again, I, I don't know where it came from. I imagine at some point it, it ended up in a civilian's hands and maybe a long time ago, they happened to just change the stock out with whatever was available then. As I ended up buying a uh, Vietnam War error stock 
and putting it on here. So it's a little bit more true. Uh, this is an original sling as far as I can tell from the markings and everything. And then of course we have our markings here and then it's inland underneath here in the 4 million, upper 4 million serial range. This one's pretty interesting too because it has the, um, the updated sight right here, but it has the push button magazine release. It, it does not have the lever like the uh, the newer styles did during the war because now you have a, a manual release here for your magazine and then you also have a push button style for your safety as well. So they changed that out to make it a little bit easier for the troops so they could differentiate so they weren't dropping mags um, while or, or maybe hitting the safety and meant to release a mag or whatever the case may be. This one has, the stock actually has some interesting marks as well. So it actually, you know, of course it, this thing was amazingly, just black when I got this thing. And it actually has some like, um, some marks on here. So you could only imagine, you know, these little little notches in the stock, maybe that was the amount of kills that the, the guy that was carrying this gun had with this. This is what's cool about this, is because if this gun could tell a story, I would sit here for hours and hours and just listen to it because these things have seen something. And as opposed to the new end ones, I don't, I, I've never shot one, I don't know. But I know that I would ra much rather buy a wartime gun, knowing that it has that story, thinking about what it could have, where it could have been, what it could have seen, um, compared to a new gun that just doesn't have that. It doesn't have that same uh, story to tell and history behind it. And I think that's what's very cool. I did buy this um, magazine pouch, so they would carry two extra mags in these pouches, and it's dated 1943 as well, which is pretty dang cool. And then they had an oiler bottle back here, which doubled as a an additional sling attachment. Uh, this gun, man, it, it shoots a 30 carbine. Uh, these guys basically wanted this type of gun, postal workers and 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 guys mainly on not on the front lines, but behind the lines where they wanted something more than a pistol, but less than the M1 Garin. You know, that's or Garan. <laughs> uh, it's actually Garin, but M1 Garan. They they didn't need that but they wanted something a little bit more than a pistol. And also the training on a gun like this, uh, this is why Forgotten Weapons is probably my favorite YouTube channel out there because he's so smart with this stuff. But uh, one thing that he had mentioned is that, you know, there wasn't, you know, training on something like this compared to a pistol. This this takes a lot less training to do. So it's, it's a very, very interesting gun. And um, man, these things are great. Now, they came out with the 15 round mags originally, and then they, uh, for the M2 version, which is the select fire version, uh, they actually had the, uh, the 30 round magazines, um, and this stock actually has a little cutout for the selector switch. Of course, this one's semi-automatic, but it does have that little cutout there, so they had already switched that at that point. And really, at the end of the war, they had some, some M2s, but not very many. The war had already been over once we got to that point. So there's the M1 carbine that I have uh, right now. Here's an interesting piece I picked up in an antique shop up in Tennessee. Um, this lady that owns the place is pretty awesome. She has a guy that collects World War II memorabilia, gives it to her so she can sell it. And of course, you know, there's some kind of cut there, but they had this uh, last year and I was eyeballing it and I was like, man, if it's here when I come back, I'll get it. Six months later, we went back and it was there and I bought it. And it, you know, it's very interesting. So what we have, it's 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 actually a lampshade. It's a piece of trench art made uh, during World War II. That's the only thing I can think. And the only thing I really can't validate is this helmet here. So of course it has the Marines uh, insignia there. From the markings that I saw online, this doesn't really match up though. It looks like an AH or maybe an HV, something like that. There's some scratches and stuff in here. Of course, it doesn't have any of the liner. And it looks like these guys just shot a, a, a bullet right through it. Looks like a nine mil or something like that. And they use it as the lampshade post. So this actually has 30 carbine pull strings, 50 cal little uh, decorations right there. And then a 37 millimeter artillery shell with a brass Marines logo in the middle. Some kind of brass plate or something that they that they riveted to this piece of wood. This plug is super old, check that out. Man, I don't think that would pass any code anywhere 
uh, these days. But that's that's how old this thing is, man. And it's it's so interesting. I had to buy it because I thought it would be such a cool collector's piece, you know, if you're into this kind of thing. And this basically, this basically just goes on top and they have this little uh, little piece right here that's threaded thread it on right there and just try it. it doesn't thread down all the way too so I just kind of stick it in there like that somebody said I should put some bulbs in it and try to work it I really have no interest in that I just I just like that it's actually there to be honest with you so here was the gun that started my first dive into the German side of the war this is an AC 43 p38 the AC-43, or the AC part of that, is the code for Mauser. So you had Mauser, Spreework, and Walther. Um, and I'm sorry, the AC is, is code for uh, Walther. Um, so they use these codes so the Allies wouldn't easily know who was making the guns and, you know, basically where these factories actually were. Um, there are some early guns with some Walther um, banners on them, but they, they changed that pretty quickly. And again, this one is a 1943 version. So at this point, you have your Bakelite grips, which kind of have a reddish tint to them, which I think is pretty neat. Um, you have this uh, exposed barrel with this really interesting locking block type of wedged design. So basically what happens, pull the hammer back. To a certain point, the barrel and the locking block are gonna move back until there, that disconnect happens. And then just the slide finishes the rest of the cycling there. Of course, this one does have the uh, Waffen marks and the Reich Saddler on there um, and all of that kind of cool stuff, which is just, it's just an amazing piece of history. So I have one wartime mag that's actually marked P38. And then I have one after the war, um, which is actually marked Walther P38 nine millimeter. Um, and then I think it's the mid fifties where these guys stay, you know, the, the Bundeswehr, which is the new German army, um, in 1955 or 1957, they actually uh, continue production on this, but as the P1. Um, so, and actually the Beretta M9 takes from the same type of locking block design, which is pretty dang cool. And this is known as like kind of one of the first successfuls or the first successful double to single action guns. Now the double action on this gun is not great. It's, it's long and it's heavy. It's not fantastic, but when you get into the single action, it's absolutely amazing. And it actually has a, you know, safety decocker, right? So I can leave it like that if I want to, or I can put it back up into the fire position, but now I'm on double action. So now I can carry it like a modern type of firearm. So it is a very cool thing. Actually has this heel style magazine release, okay? And this is what the Wehrmacht carry. This is the general army this is what these guys are actually carrying all the correct proof marks and stuff and i just i love this gun when i said that this is my favorite shooting gun so far i i actually do mean that and it has a loaded chamber indicator these guys are just they they were making amazing guns and it's so cool when i look at this it, it's a reminder of two things the germans make amazing guns they did then they do now it's also a reminder that we won the war because now we have these as relics that we can we can be reminded of that period. But it's also a reminder that we won and they lost and that's a good thing. So it's 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 really cool to have this in my possession and in my collection. And I'd love to get a Mauser and a spree work to kind of go along with that uh, Walther there. The next Walther we're going to talk about is one you haven't seen a video on yet, and that's because we're currently working on it. But this is a Walther PP and there's a lot that goes into uh, these guns and generally speaking the officers and stuff would carry the smaller PP and the PPK while the Wehrmacht would carry the Walther P38 and this gun it's chambered in 32 ACP which is readily available although pretty expensive everything's expensive right now when it comes to ammo but um, it is still available but you know in their conversion it's a 7.65 millimeter uh, cartridge. So again, we have a double to single action type of setup here with the double action being, eh, it's, it's pretty heavy, dude. There's no slide stop or anything like that. Kind of just lower that back down. Came with one magazine, so I have to get another mag for it. But the double action, it's actually a little bit better than it is on the P38, I think. The single action is amazing. So I can't wait to get this out. 
and actually try it out. And there's so many different, you know, versions there. I, as far as what I can tell, Legacy Collectibles has a, um, has a chart that you can look at. They'll send this to you. As far as I can tell, with the black grips and with the markings I have, no matching mag, um, it's a fourth variation of the Walther PP. And again, this one does have a loaded chamber indicator right there in the rear. Of course, it does have the Reich Saddler and all of that on this side as well in two places. And then it actually also has one up on the barrel here, although it's really hard to kind of make out there, but it is definitely there. So another interesting gun from Walther. What I thought was interesting, and maybe some of you guys know this, I don't, is that they actually had the Walther banner on this version. Uh, and this being the fourth variation, um, that was pretty basically middle of the war, late war. Um, so why they weren't using the same kind of codes, I don't really know. So this one is definitely pretty cool. Obviously, I think the more uh, the more desirable gun is the Walther PPK, and that's an entirely different segment with party leader guns and um, RZM guns and, and all kinds of things. So the PP and the PPK are a little bit different. The PPK, I think that's what I'm going to go with next. But you have like a, a let's say a, a wartime gun being, I don't know, $2,500, maybe three grand. And then you get a party leader gun, which Legacy Collectibles, um, they also uh, listed one very recently for like $11,000. And it has the grips with the Reich Saddler and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of variations. There's a lot of things that are faked, which is one reason why I like them. I don't, I don't have any affiliation with them, but I know that they get GI bringbacks um, and, and things like that. So you don't have any import marks and all that kind of stuff, which is pretty cool, at least for the wartime um, type of guns. So, so there's a lot that goes into this entire uh, segment of World War II guns. And if you think that you've gone down the rabbit hole with modern guns, wait until you get into World War I, World War II uh, type of firearms because you will really start to see that, you know, $500 Glocks are expensive, but these guns are super expensive. Now, what's really cool is that, let's say you go with like a Walther P1, uh, which is a uh, an after war type of thing from I don't know 55 57 uh, is when the Bundeswehr uh, the new German army started so uh, they started making P ones again and you know those can be had for pretty dang reasonable prices um, it's just these wartime and pre wartime guns uh, that are just super expensive and you know the thing is is that supply and demand is slowly starting to dwindle, especially the supply. And it's just one of those things. So I, I really love this aspect. It's, it's more, it's more than a collection to me. It's more of a, uh, it, it's more about collecting the story, um, and, and just putting some of those pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, obviously they're trophies to us. And, and again, I'll say this again, this to me means that we beat this ideology, that we have these as trophies, and I think that's really cool. But it's also cool to me that something like this, if it could tell a story, I would sit there forever and just listen. And it, it has, whatever the story may be, we'll never know with this particular gun or this particular gun or whatever. Um, but I, I really, really have, have dove uh, head deep into uh, the World War II aspect, really. I haven't done so much with World War One just yet, but World War II, man, I've really loved reading and learning and listening um, to the stories and, and all of this kind of stuff because I think it's just really interesting, man. And I, I love history, and this is probably my favorite period in history uh, so far. And it's cool that we have guns that are kind of on the cusp of modern technology where they still... They still kind of hark back to the olden days, but you can tell some of this technology is really catching up. And then in the middle of war as well, uh, it's very interesting to me. So this is what I've collected so far, and hopefully uh, you'll stick around with us and we'll start uh, doing some more of these World War II videos because that's my goal, 2021, do more World War II gun reviews and related videos. So thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. And as always, hold them down.